thank you so much for joining our webinar this evening. My name is Emma Coleman, and I am the organizing representative for our Iowa Beyond Coal campaign based here in Des Moines. Um, and our goal is to see Iowa make an, a, a just transition to clean renewable energy by 2030. So for those of you that aren't familiar with our campaign work. Um, as many of you know, we've been doing this webinar series since the start of the year. It was an idea that our team had last fall to bring Sierra Club expertise to Iowa specific issues for our members and supporters across the state, especially during the colder winter months. So this will be our last one since things have warmed up and we're doing more in person, but I look forward to doing it again next year. Uh, I worked closely with Pam, our Iowa chapter director, to select these topics and presenters for each month. Uh, she's on vacation, a much deserved vacation this week, so she is not a panelist with us tonight, um, but I'm sure we'll watch the recording later. Uh, for this month's webinar, I am so excited to introduce Professor David Hofer. David is originally from Eastern Iowa and currently lives in Northwestern Iowa, where he is a professor of biology at Briarcliff University. David is also involved in the Northwest Iowa Group of Sierra Club and is on the Iowa Chapters Executive Committee. Uh, many of you are probably already familiar with him, which is awesome. Uh, David has a great presentation for us tonight on wildlife corridors and the climate crisis. There is an, a Q&A option um, on Zoom you all should have access to, so please feel free to submit questions as they come up, and David is going to kind of field them as we go. Um, so yeah, without further ado, David, take it away. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, excellent. And Emma is going to help me in terms of making sure that I see the questions that you um, have. And yeah, just stop me at any point uh, during the presentation. Um, thanks everyone for joining. And what I want to do with this presentation is kind of give a broad overview of a lot of the state of the science in terms of how climate change is affecting wildlife and then an idea of how that it is actually affecting Iowa and how it can affect Iowa into the future for both good if we take action and for ill if we don't. Uh, some of the topics that I want to go over here are just to remind everyone of the state of Iowa's natural lands currently. Um, then the fact that species ranges are shifting in the wake of climate change um, the phenology and how uh, there are phenological changes now, and I'll define what phenology is if you're not familiar with that, tor that term, um, broad scale ecosystemic changes. And here we're looking at a larger change like in biomes. What's more specifically happening to temperate ecosystems? There's actually some good news potentially there for us. So <laughs> that's always important. And then of course, a little bit on invasive species um, and pathogens. But Iowa today, well, you probably know that Iowa is the most biologically altered state uh, in the nation. And as far as I know, in all of North America, uh, Iowa historically was about 70% prairie. That was probably mostly tall grass prairie, but not all tall grass prairie. Uh, about 10% wetlands and then 20% woodlands. As you can see here, the woodlands and the wetlands are definitely endangered because more than 80% of the woodlands have been cut down. 98% of our wetlands have been drained. Obviously, we know so much of that is for agriculture, which contributes to Iowa's very low ranking in terms of water quality across the United States. But the prairie, there's less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the original prairie remaining, only about 30,000 acres across the state. And when we put that into perspective in the state, you can see this handy dandy graphic here, about two thirds of Iowa in the summer is corn and soybeans. This says 63%, you know, rounded up. Um, most of the rest of Iowa is other types of crops, um, CAFOs, uh, pasture land, that sort of thing. 
if you look down here to the kind of the southwest of, of this state, you can see that 3% of Iowa's incorporated areas, that's the amount of land area that's taken up by our cities and towns. Notice that it's only slightly more land, yeah, about 200,000 acres more, than roads. And then below roads, we have all public lands, and then DNR lands. Now, in all public lands, that 2%, half of that is actually road right of way. So basically, the ditches along roads are public land. And so if there are like little strips of prairie or something like that along the roads, those are considered natural areas. So basically, we've devoted more land area in Iowa to roads than we have to preserving natural lands and natural areas. And I just want to remind everyone um, of this that's put very well by Paul Jepson and uh, Kane Blythe right away in their rewilding book, that um, we internalize what we learned as children. So as they say, each generation assumes the nature they experienced in their youth to be normal. So think about the generations growing up in Iowa now where they think that the lack of natural areas is normal. I don't know about you. I've had conversations with those where we say, yeah, I got to drive 15 minutes this way. I got to drive 30 minutes that way and you can get to a park. And it's like, yeah, see, there's lots of natural areas around. And then I'm like, no, that means there's not lots of natural areas around if we always have to drive that far just to find one. So let's get into a little bit about what uh, climate change is doing. It's very difficult, uh, or at least I found it very difficult, to localize climate change just in the United States or in Iowa specifically. And the reason is, of course, the range of studies come from around the world and the best evidence that we have so far, the best studies, really look at regional perspectives up to the global perspective. And so it's easier to actually make some uh, conclusions based upon those studies. So when we look at the regional scale studies, also studies that have included entire continents, Europe in particular, so much information has come out of Europe. Um, what we can conclude is this, Species are either moving up mountains if they live next to mountains, or they're moving toward the poles. This includes plants, this includes animals, this includes all taxonomic groups for which we have long-term data. Uh, so what that means is that in the Northern Hemisphere, species are moving toward the North Pole. In the Southern Hemisphere, species are moving toward the South Pole. When we look at what are called meta-analyses, which then take all of these smaller studies and then try to you know, do this broad scale, what are the big lessons that we have learned from all of these? Um, there are five different meta-analyses that have been conducted in the past couple of uh, decades. What's been found is that round about half of all species that have been studied have exhibited significant changes. So not just changes, but in scientific terms, significant changes um, in distributions over the period for which they were studied. And that period includes um, two decades to seven decades. It depends on where we're talking about where the good data um, have occurred. Um, one of the things I'd like to highlight here is the second indented bullet point. This has been documented in every taxonomic group for which long-term data exist. This includes land-based species. It also includes marine species. Um, so basically all species are on the move. So one of the questions that we can then ask is, well, how quickly are they on the move? If they're moving toward the poles, what, what type of, of movement speed can we expect? Well, the first thing to do is to look at how quickly the changes in climate are moving across the landscape. So this is a concept that's called velocity of climate change. And velocity of climate change, as you can see here, is a ratio. It takes the time gradient, that's the, the temporal, um, and relates it to a spatial gradient. So basically what that measures then is the rate of temperature tr change across the landscape. That's basically what's happening. So how quickly is um, the temperature changing? So if you 
uh, have an average high in July of 80 degrees Fahrenheit where you live, how quickly is that average high moving north? And the answer is about 27 and a half kilometers per decade, or about 2.74 to 2.75 kilometers per year. That's pretty fast. That is actually quite fast. And where the velocity of climate change has been occurring the quickest, which is primarily in the deeper oceans, as well as at the higher elevations in mountain ecosystems, we're now seeing whole scale biome shifts beginning. And when a biome shifts, we're talking about like um, a, a, a tundra on, on top of a mountain, you know, just below the snowpack, changing to coniferous forest. We're talking about the coniferous forest further down the mountain, changing to the broadleaf forest. So it's a, it's a change in entire species assemblages. Normally with that type of turnover, um, you get tons and tons of species extinctions and lowered biodiversity overall. If you're not familiar with how we look at, you know, what are these, you know, how, where are the isotherms as they're called, which is, uh, like I said, if it, the average high is 80 degrees Fahrenheit in July, what we usually do is we draw a line across a map. Well, there are more modern ways of visualizing it. And one of the more modern ways is right here. This comes from NASA. And this is looking at the temperature changes across the entire globe from 1880 to 2022. And as you can see here, the isotherms are represented by colors. I don't think we need to tell anyone which colors are warmer. And yeah, that's recent right there. <laughs> so recent, you can see that um, the area of the globe that has warmed most quickly is the Arctic. And notice what that's done to Asia and Europe. Asia and Europe have experienced the heat much more than we have here in North America. Uh, and that's probably due to a lot of the, the um, upper atmospheric wind patterns. But overall, the entire globe has essentially um, heated up. So because of that, that is putting tremendous pressures on wildlife. And in summary, then, I just summarized this coherency and patterns to biological change. Basically, all of the studies conclude that the species that are affected are moving their ranges. Um, what I have not summarized for you are the next two bullet points, which is there's a lot of scientific literature looking at how um, ecological processes of species and in ecosystems, and then the physiological processes um, within the species themselves uh, are, are linked to the climate variables. Uh, and then there are what are called diagnostic fingerprints of climate change. This is basically looking at genetics and plotting the genetics of species across space and time, so biogeography. When all of these are put together, the conclusion that, that can be made, a causal link can be made between climate change that we've observed in the 20th century and the impacts of biology. So if people ask, well, species might be moving for other reasons. There are always local reasons for species to be on the move, but the main cause is climate change. All right, a little bit about phenology. Um, if you're not familiar with the word phenology, it's basically recurring patterns in nature. As you can see here, seasonal timing of expression of life history traits. So when do the birds come back in spring? When do they migrate south in fall? Uh, when they do the insects first emerge in spring? You know, that sort of thing. These are seasonal um, patterns. And if we look at plants over the northern hemisphere, the timing of when the growing season of plants on average occurs has advanced by minus 5.2 days per decade, as you can see between about 1980 and 2000. Okay, what does that minus 5.2 days per decade mean? Well, let's say that um, plants really begin, their buds begin to, to grow and they begin to sprout flowers, you know, and that sort of thing on May 1st. And this was back in 1982. 
Well, then by 1992, minus five days, now they're sprouting on April 25th. And then a decade later, they're sprouting on April 20th. So that's what happened over the course of just two decades. They, they advanced by a week and a half. Uh, and we've generally seen that. Uh, spring generally occurs about two to three weeks earlier now than it did just about 40 years ago. And fall occurs about two to three weeks later on average than it did about 40 years ago. Uh, so those are just kind of averages. What does this do to species? Well, I, I give you one thing here. Um, we often have very warm periods now in say mid to late winter. That can actually stimulate some trees and other plants to flower. And of course, that's not good for them because when they do that, then it's still winter. There's likely to be a cold snap afterwards. You get a freeze and now those buds die. And now those plants can't grow as well in that growing season. Plus whatever eats them, which is often the insects, don't have enough food. And if the insects don't have enough food, then the birds and other animals that eat the insects don't have enough food. So that's one of the things that we're worried about and that um, scientists have actually been uh, at least beginning to catalog in various areas. Some of the good evidence for this comes from mountainous regions. So I'm not gonna show you the specifics of this, but basically this, uh, this idea of the plants can actually emerge sooner in spring means that they can emerge now before the insects that would eat them emerge. And then the insects are also emerging prior to when the birds come back and start to nest. So the plants generally are keeping up with climate change better than the insects are. And the insects are generally keeping up with climate change a little bit better than the birds are. So as you go up the food chain, there becomes a greater delay. And that creates what we call an ecological mismatch. And now the insects, when they um, are emerging, are, are in great abundance. The problem is there isn't enough food for them. And then when the birds come back and they nest, there often isn't enough food for them. And that affects the reproduction and the populations of all of those species over time. You've probably heard that over the last 50 years or so, We've lost about 3 billion birds in North America. Well, this is not the main reason for that, but it can be a reason for the continued decline of birds in North America. Um, and of course, we should be concerned about pollinators, right? A lot of us have planted pollinator gardens. Uh, we've been, uh, we've participated in other types of ecological restorations and we want the insect pollinators um, to be around. We know that they are in trouble and that's largely been linked to the agricultural pesticides that have been put on the landscape here in North America and also in Europe. Well, again, the plants generally emerge faster than the insects emerge in comparison to climate change. And that makes insects suffer. Now, if an insect species is a generalist, that may not be as much of a problem for them because they might have a preferred food, but they're a generalist so they can go eat something else, right? It's sort of like, um, you know, someone who is your typical American meatitarian and they have to have a hamburger or something like that. They're like, well, okay, I can mate you with a salad today, right? But a specialist can't do that. The specialist has got to have the hamburger and cannot eat the salad. Well, the problem with that is Doug Tallamy over at the University of Delaware has estimated that just over 90% of insects in North America are habitat specialists. And so this means that as we go forward in this century, we might be looking at great declines in the insect species. Insects remember, I mean, this is not something that was captured people's attention, right? So the poster child for um, climate change, of course, is the polar bear, right? Everyone loved polar bears. Um, if you if you put up an unknown bee or something like that, a wasp, people would be like, well, I'm not interested in that. The problem is we should be because insects in terrestrial ecosystems are the critical ecological link between 
the micro micrological world and the macrological world. In other words, the world of the things that are very small and we need a microscope to see them, the microbes, and the plants and animals that we know and love. So if the insects disappear from the terrestrial world, well, then you just don't want amphibians or reptiles or birds or mammals around either. All right, with that nice, happy note, let's look at some broad scale changes. <laughs> Uh, broad scale changes are just a little bit different. Um, broad scale changes are looking at changes across whole regions and possibly uh, entire ecosystems. So what happens when broad scale changes happen on a rapid scale is that you have population crashes over the entire region. So what are examples of these? Well, how about mega fires, right? Here in Sioux City, uh, we had some haze last week, and that was due to wildfires up in Canada again. And of course, that happened last summer for I don't remember how many weeks. Um, wildfires out west have been worse. Uh, and in fact, the fire season out west have been, has been extended by at least 10 weeks, um, if not 12 weeks. So basically three more months of wildfire season out west due to changes in the climate. Everything's getting drier. It's more likely to um, be set on fire. Um, the droughts that have been happening here in Iowa, that have been happening in our West, that have been happening across the Midwest, have been happening in so many places, uh, can trigger a lot of die-offs of vegetation, uh, most notably tree die-offs. They also cause a lot of stress on um, native plants, and when plants are stressed, it's just like us. If we get stressed, we're more likely to come down um, ill. Plants the same way, they can't make what are called the secondary chemicals as well that would actually deter uh, an herbivore or a fungus from uh, getting in and, and uh, causing the plant to become sick or something like that. So you have greater pest and pathogen outbreaks um, due to climate change. And then, of course, there are there are the other things like hurricanes, tornadoes, which I don't know about you. I've seen enough of those in Iowa already this spring. We don't need any more. Um, or what are called wind throw events. Remember the derecho that hit Iowa, basically the inland hurricane. Um, what was that, three years ago now? Um, four years ago? Something like that. Um, these are things that cause rapid, broad-scale changes. And how much of the landscape across the world might be susceptible to these things. About half of the global land area is calculated to be susceptible to uh, the types of changes that will cause whole scale shifts in biomes and therefore lots and lots of species extinctions. Um, and I did just point out, of course, the lethal drought events for trees are becoming more frequent here in North America, as well as um, elsewhere. And why should we be concerned? Well, what happens out to the West actually affects Iowa. One of the main reasons is because of something that's now called ecoclimatic teleconnections. So yes, with our phones, we're always connected. Well, with ecology, we're always connected as well. Um, what an ecoclimatic teleconnection is, is if you think about the mountains to the West, as the air masses come in off of the Pacific Ocean, they go up in elevation as they hit the mountains, whether that's the Cascades or that's the Sierra Nevadas, or they make it to the Rockies or something like that. But as they go up in elevation, the air mass cools. And as it cools, clouds form and eventually precipitation falls. So if you look on the east side of the mountains, um, like you go out to Washington State, uh, on the east side of the Cascades, it's a near desert. But on the west side of the Cascades, I mean, things grow so fast, you can measure some of the plants growing in feet per year. Um, it's it's just amazing where, how it's lush and green on the side that gets all the precipitation, and then on the side that does not get the precipitation, of course, it's very, very dry. Well, now consider the plains. It gets drier and drier the further west you go as you get toward the Rockies. So where does so much of our precipitation in Iowa come from? It comes from the transpiration of water from the root systems, ultimately through the leaves of the plants to our west. 
So if there are whole scale changes to the plants to our west, that's going to cause whole scale changes to precipitation patterns here in Iowa, which is then going to be a positive feedback loop causing changes to the vegetation in Iowa, which would then affect um, transpiration in Iowa, which is then going to affect states to our east. So those are eco-climatic teleconnections. When you get these broad, but broad scale, but rapid changes in ecosystems somewhere on the globe, it's going to affect other areas of the globe. All right. Maybe it's time for just a little bit of hope. <laughs> so um, first, uh, in temperate ecosystems, as I mentioned, spring is coming about two to th three weeks earlier. Fall is extending about two to three weeks later into the fall. What does that mean? As long as we're not getting droughts, growing seasons are extended. Um, so that can be good and bad. That means that allergy seasons are also extended for those of us who suffer from allergies, um, but it also means that potentially, um, you know, we can grow, we have longer to grow crops, that sort of thing. Um, the extreme events, so the extreme weather events in winter have declined in general. So in other words, when you get that incredible cold week in December where the temperature doesn't get above zero, even during the day, um, those have have diminished in terms of frequency. However, the really warm snaps, such as you get, what did we get, like 85 degrees in April this year? That's incredibly hot for that time of year. The, the 95 degrees that we've been getting at the end of May for the past couple of years, the weeks of you know 100 degrees and that sort of thing um, in July, those have increased in frequency. The, the trends of the growing seasons extending, fewer and fewer, you know, extremely cold events in winter and more and more extremely hot events in summer are expected to continue. Um, that's potentially a problem because there is some research that is showing that it's really those extreme weather events that are triggered by climate change that might have a greater impact on most species than the average increase in temperature. However, here's the good news. For those of us in the temperate area, um, remember the average velocity of climate change across the globe is roughly about 2.7 to 2.8 kilometers per year. But look in the temperate areas. We're basically in the temperate broadleaf forest. It's been about 0.35 kilometers per year, much, much slower. What does that mean? That means that if we have proper connections between remaining natural areas in Iowa and other areas um, in the temperate zone, plants and animals may be able to move fast enough um, to keep up with climate change. So they're moving north, but they might be able to keep up with climate change. I know that now is not the time to remind you that less than 2% of Iowa's natural lands, <laughs> but that's the good news. So if we have the opportunity, if we can actually create the corridors to um, allow the plants and animals to move, then they might actually be able to naturally adapt. So what would that look like for Iowa in the future? What that means is there's probably a number of species that we are used to here in Iowa that are going to move north into Minnesota and ultimately into Canada. And they're, they're no longer going to breed here in Iowa. But there are other species that breed south, like in Missouri, in Oklahoma, and even Texas, that are moving up toward Iowa. So as we get closer and closer to 2100, maybe the biology of Iowa looks a lot more like the biology of Texas or Oklahoma. So the overall biodiversity of Iowa might be largely maintained, but it's maintained because a lot of species go north and exit Iowa, and then other species come north to replace the ones that left Iowa. That will result in what are called novel ecosystems. 
A novel ecosystems is an association of species that have never existed together before on the face of the earth. Um, that's going to cause a lot of other changes and potentially local species extinctions. But at least there's some good news there. <laughs> so if you're worried about climate change and that it's all bad news, it's not all bad news, but it, there, it can still be some, some hope. All right, I'm just going to give you a, a couple pieces of empirical evidence. I've largely shied away from it, but I'm just going to give you these. Uh, a lot of people, we, Iowa is a land of rivers. We also have lakes. And here in Sioux City, we're not too far from the Iowa Great Lakes region. Um, here's one study that looked at um, the near shore uh, habitats of lakes where the sun can penetrate all the way through and therefore they can heat up during the summer versus um, the deeper lake where the sun can't penetrate. And what happened is that lake trout, as you can see here, um, decoupled. Their diet became um, increasingly derived not from the near shore, but from the deeper parts of the lake, simply because they couldn't stand the warmer temperatures. And it looks like we have a couple of questions, and I, I'm unable to see what they are. Emma, can you read them? I was just doing a quick time check for you. It's uh, 634. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, you're doing great. And then the next one that that I will um, tell you about are spiders. Again, we generally don't care about spiders, but our bird friends eat spiders. So maybe we should care about them. This was actually conducted in a grassland. And grasslands have different levels, just like forests do. So a species that likes to be down toward the ground in the grassland is largely shielded from most of the wind um, doesn't receive direct sun, et cetera. Uh, it's going to be more humid down there. Uh, but a species that likes to roam about up in the grass itself is going to be more exposed to the wind, is going to be more exposed to the sun. Uh, the humidity is going to be less. It's going to be drier, those types of things. Well, the problem is, as the temperatures heat up, then that upper area in the grasses can just get too warm for a lot of species. And this is what happened in this particular experiment. There are two different types of spiders. And of course, they're both predators. But one of them is what we typically think of as a spider. It's a sit and wait predator. It liked the lower areas of the grassland. It would spin a web, wait for something to get caught in it, and then go and eat it. But the other spider was an active hunter. Uh, it would roam around in the upper parts of the grasses trying to find its prey. But as um, the temperature was raised, it couldn't stand the temperature. So it went lower in the grasses to get away from the extremely warm temperatures where it encountered the sit and wait spider. So there were two different types of predators. And what happened is when they encountered each other, one of them ate the other. <laughs> And it was, they were so effective at it that the spider that spun the webs extincted the active predatory spider. Um, that might not sound bad to us, but if you're a bird and you prefer to eat the active predatory spider, it would sound bad to you. The other thing is, is that each spider would take a different type of prey and therefore it can change the entire ecosystem. All right. Just a little bit on invasive species, and they react the same way that other species do, where they're on the move as well. Unfortunately, what that means for our native species is that as they get stressed by the extreme climate events, the that means that invasive species are more likely to be able to take over in an ecosystem. So just as when the native species become stressed, they can't fight off the pests, they can't fight off the diseases, that sort of thing, they also can't fight off invading species. And so invasive species are likely to spread easier uh, across the face of the earth and here in Iowa as well. I give you an example here. You've, you've heard of the pine bark beetles. I'm going to focus on the last one here. Another grassland study an invasion of non-native grasses. That actually changed the ecology of that grassland ecosystem. 
Because what happened is it changed the fire regime. Often the invasive species doesn't like fire as much as the native species do. And sometimes what they can do is they can make the area um, wetter or more humid, thus meaning that fires don't come through as frequently. And if fires don't come through as frequently, then it's more likely that that species is gonna be able to further invade and the native species are not gonna do as well, which then sets up, it's, it's, a, it's a positive feedback loop where the invasive species takes over, creates ecological conditions that are more favorable to itself. And eventually you get this monoculture of that invasive species. And of course, we're talking about climate change. So I got to end this little area of it too on a very bad note. Um, Lyme disease. Anyone like Lyme disease? Uh, <laughs> um, the incidence of Lyme disease has been calculated as increasing in North America by between 150 to 500 percent this century. Why? Climate change. Uh, there are a couple different causes of that. Again, one of them is it, our native species are probably going to be more susceptible to Lyme disease. They're going to be under stress more, and therefore there might be a greater prevalence of it in um, ecosystems. But the second thing is the deer ticks that carry the Lyme disease are on the move. They're going north. So anyone who has thought that you need to flee to Canada for good weather, that's where Lyme disease is going. So it'll catch up to you pretty soon. <laughs> that's the unfortunate part of it. All right. So here's where I want to talk a little bit about then what can we do? What does this mean for Iowa? How can we get involved? And how can we make sure that, you know, there's going to be a better future for our kids and for younger people like Emma, right? We need um, we need some hope here. So um, can I jump in real quick, David? Yes, we had a question hand. about uh, deer ticks and whether they have predators. Uh, deer ticks do have predators. They do have natural predators. There are a variety of species um, that will eat them. And if we restore areas of habitat, the nice thing is, is that there will be more predators of the deer ticks. So there are areas where the frequency of the ticks have increased greatly. That's associated with a reduction in the number of predators of deer ticks. It's also associated with a reduction in the number of what are called incompetent hosts. The incompetent hosts are the, are, are the natural species that cannot transmit the disease very well. Um, so if you have greater biodiversity, uh, and there are studies that show this, there's a lowered incidence of human diseases as well. Interesting. Hilarious term, incompetent host. Yeah, I know. The incompetent host is the one you want. I've this before. <laughs> the competent host is the one you don't want. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Well, while I'm off mute, another quick time check. We got 20 minutes. So tell okay. us the good news, please. <laughs> okay. So here's um, some good news. So again, Species are moving toward the North Pole, or if they're near mountains, they're, they're moving up the mountains. Altitude approximates latitude. But we, of course, have fragmented the landscape, nowhere more so than here in Iowa, where we've so greatly reduced the natural areas. So that species in Iowa have to go across roadways, and roadways are like moving walls, moving death walls, if you will. Um, so many species die uh, based on on trying to cross our roadways. And then of course they have to get across now a very inhospitable agricultural landscape that with the shift to more industrialized agriculture that happened in the 1970s is probably more inhospitable to most species than it was when we had the more traditional family farms prior to the 1970s. So with all that fragmentation, what do we need? Corridors. <laughs> We need corridors. Um, they will link our remaining natural areas and in and of themselves also increase the amount of native plants and animals that we have here in Iowa. Um, why would we want to do that? Well, again, native plants support native insects. So here's a study, you know, um, landscapes with few native plants had lower insect biomass abundance and diversity. Okay, that confirms that. 
native insects support native birds. Over 80% of birds, at least during the time that they're nesting, eat insects because insects are wonderful sources of protein for them and especially for their offspring. And all of those feathers are made out of keratin, which is a protein. It's our hair and our fingernails. Um, so they need a lot of protein in order to grow. So they feed their, uh, their offspring a good source of protein, the insects. So if we restore native plants, that will help our native insect populations to become more abundant, which means that our native birds will have more food, which means that they too can become more abundant. And in the process, there are other species like mammals and reptiles and other species that also eat the insects that will also become more abundant. So how could we do this in Iowa? Well, here's where I uh, want to urge you to go to the website of Iowa's group called Be Wild, Rewild. And they have a plan for this. And we could actually contact our representatives uh, and help to try to uh, push for a plan like this. The plan is politically sensitive. So instead of going for the best land, by the way, the best land is where most species want to live as well. But of course, we've taken that over for agriculture. So what Be Wild Rewild have done is they focused on the steepest slopes, slopes with gradients greater than 9%. And the proposal here is they'll just be retired from cultivation, possibly from grazing, although grazing can be supported on native prairies as well. Um, also, areas that flood at least once every five years, just return them to wetlands, you know, get rid of cultivation and grazing from those lands. Now, how could this be done? Because um, anyone who knows farming knows that farmers tend to not have a whole bunch of money in the bank. The money is their land and they have to make their land work every year. So, A, we could promote buyout programs. Buy out a lot of farmland that is steep, flood prone, um, or that is critical habitat in some way, such as climatically imperiled areas. Um, work on making the conservation reserve program permanent, right? Right now, I think it's only for 10 years and let's make it permanent. So farmers have the choice of saying, you know what? I want those acres of my land to be permanently a prairie, to be permanently a forest, to be permanently um, a wetland. Uh, do our part, become involved in the Iowa Natural um, Heritage Foundation, for instance. It's a land trust, help land trusts acquire land. The Nature Conservancy is largely uh, a land trust. And then there are, are other ways as well to create the financial incentives for landowners to conserve land. What could then happen? Well, Iowa could then look something like this. With all of that green space there, you see largely following Iowa's great rivers. Um, these are areas that either can be kind of renewed right now, that, that they are largely green right now, and uh, with a little bit of uh, restoration work, they could become even better, um, or areas that can be restored. Then you see these lines through here that are kind of amber. These are areas that are largely along our river systems that could become corridors and also cross um, uh, private farmland. So Iowa's basically 95% privately owned land, more than 95% privately owned land. This plan keeps the land in private ownership. So we don't need big government buyouts um, of land. But as you can see here, if you trace the green space through here, it's connected. In many areas, it's connected in very thin strips, but it's still connected. And the larger... Um, vision that I'm not showing you here is that south of Iowa, it's connected to a very large and relatively intact area called the Ozarks. Um, it can go up to the boundary waters in Minnesota, up into northern Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin. And so there are large core areas that Iowa can be connected to. And now plants and animals can cross Iowa. If I zoom in here just on um, Sioux City, you can see what's happening there. You can see the city and you can see um, the Missouri River, the, the blue line that then becomes white around Sioux City. But notice so much 
green area potential um, uh, in, in the area. You can look at the legend on the left and see some of the lighter greens as being, you know, rewilding priority areas, that sort of thing. Um, and if I zoom in just a little bit more, I'm going to go into an area near Correctionville here. Now you can see one of the corridors. What does a corridor look when, like when we zoom in on it? Well, it's a wider area of restored green area than you may have previously thought, but notice that red line. That red line is an area that needs to go across privately owned farmland. This is where we need to talk with um, farmers. We need to talk with landowners um, and ask them to get involved, to encourage them to get involved uh, and tell them, hey, we want to work with you. We're not trying to take your land from you. What we would like is that if you would like to, to encourage you and, and then if you would like to put some of your acreage into conservation reserve, wetland reserve, or another program, um, we would like to do so in a pattern that links natural areas together to create corridors uh, so that plants and animals can move across Iowa again like they used to be able to. All right. When If this was done, basically 25% of Iowa would then be rewilded space again. Um, and I've already mentioned corridors largely follow the, the, the waterways. We don't do anything to, to current reserves. They're maintained. Um, they're, the plan also includes buffer zones around cities and towns um, and preserves um, the private ownership that is the history of Iowa. Another reason to do this is because prairies are fantastic at sequestering carbon in the soils. In fact, prairies tend to do this better than most other ecosystems do. That's because most of the biomass of prairie plants is below ground. Um, while about 50% of the roots of prairie plants dies each year, what's been found is that the carbon in those roots is then taken up by the microbes um, that are either eating the roots or breaking them down or something like that, so that the carbon remains in the soils. Even if you get a large fire that comes through a prairie, it's not as bad as a large fire that comes through a forest because not as much of the carbon that was stored in that ecosystem is put back into the atmosphere through the fire. Most of the carbon is stored below ground. So actually, I just summarized this for you too. I know you want to read it, but in the interest of time, I, I might go forward here, but I just kind of summarized this. Um, Prairies store carbon in their roots, which then extends out into the microbe community in the soil. And prairies really are able to store um, carbon in the soils. That is then a carbon sink. And so when we restore prairies here in Iowa, we're helping to at least limit the amount of carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere. But let's talk about a couple elephants in the room now. Um, that are probably, you know, uh, you've already thought of, but I haven't directly addressed. What is causing climate change overall? Well, the number one cause, of course, is our burning of fossil fuels. So how can we get involved in uh, helping to replace fossil fuels with the renewable energies that we know we're going to have to go to anyway, because fossil fuels are going to run out. Most, uh, the, the average time period that... Um, is calculated that we can still rely on fossil fuels is between 70 and 100 years. That's about it. So, you know, 100 years from now, we're going to have to switch to renewables anyway. Maybe we should do so before we make the planet largely uninhabitable <laughs> rather than waiting until afterwards. So how can we get involved? Well, Sierra Club, Sierra Club, um, and this Emma person that you might know, um, have been involved with trying to get Mid-America to close down two of the dirtiest coal plants in the state. And they're right here in Sioux City, where I am, um, which is George Neal North Plant and George Neal South Plant. Actually, technically, it's just north of Sioux City and just south of Sioux City. Um, but still, we'll just call them in Sioux City. As far as I know, they are the oldest coal plants in the state. Um, if they're not the oldest, they're among the oldest. And the plan is not to retire them until at least 2050. And Mid-America has come out, and uh, as far as, as I'm concerned, they seem to be pretty staunch on that. 
we need to encourage them to retire the use of coal for electricity far before then, because we cannot afford another quarter century of you know coal pollution in our air and in our water. And if you know anyone who then you know is said, well, we can't switch to wind turbines. Wind turbines kill birds. Not so much. So um, this is a, a compilation of many studies that have been done throughout North America of what actually kills birds. Uh, if you start at the top, the thing that is the friendliest to the birds are wind turbines. Uh, this is measured in millions of bird deaths um, calculated per year. So that's 0.234. In other words, 234,000 birds roughly die every year due to wind turbines. Uh, that's numbers actually been going down. Winter modern wind turbines are uh, designed better to make sure that birds don't perch on them. That was one of the problems. Birds were perching on them, and then of course they'd start to fly up. And if they fly toward the turbines, yeah, well, that's when they become splattered. Um, but notice just oil pits, uh, air pollution, water pollution, the land pollution that we experience from fossil fuels also takes a huge toll on birds. I'm just talking about open oil pits, right? Ar around um, extraction um, areas takes three times the number of birds as wind turbines do every single year, just oil pits. But then we get to electrocution, 5.6 million birds a year from our power lines. On the one hand, we can then say, maybe we should bury our power lines. But on the other hand, recent evidence has emerged that more than 50% of the bird deaths that, that have been ascribed to electrocution from power lines because the carcasses of the birds have been found underneath the power lines and that's so cause of death, probably power lines. Once that was investigated, cause of death, someone shot the bird. So it's really largely illegal shooting of birds that accounts for more than half of the 5.6 million electrocution in quotes deaths every year. Um, communication towers, 6.6 .6 million. Electrical lines themselves, 25 and a half uh, million. And then we get up to poisons, 72 million birds. Um, and this is a median estimate die every year from poisons. What are the poisons? Primarily from agriculture. So the insecticides, the pesticides, the herbicides, that sort of thing. After that, yes, collisions with vehicles take an enormous toll on birds, more than 200 million killed per year. About 600 million birds per year fly into building glass. This uh, is particularly bad in skyscrapers in our large cities, but it also occurs just you know in family homes. So again, 234,000 birds dying of wind turbines, 600 million dying because they fly into our windows. And then the last thing, if you have a cat, your cat does not need to go outside. I'm sorry, your cat might want to go outside and they might drive you nuts, but 2.4 billion birds is the median estimate for how many birds die in um, North America every year due to um, domestic and feral cats. So that's just to let every, everyone know um, when we switch to renewables, it's actually more bird friendly than burning fossil fuels is. How to become involved? Well, contact Emma. Get involved with um, Sierra Beyond Coal. Um, this That's a national campaign. Obviously, um, uh, Emma oversees um, here in Iowa, and I don't know if it's also um, regional, but um, the Beyond Coal campaign is incredibly important. And also, Emma, if you want to talk about this a little bit, there is a website up now that's called Clean Up Mid Am. As you can see here, cleanupmidam.com which is trying to hold uh, mid-American energy uh, accountable. Yeah. You want to talk about the take Maybe action can, a little bit? I'm going to drop this in the chat really quick so that people can click the link easily. Gosh, we are doing birds no favors. Uh, that's pretty <laughs> bad. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, so I dropped the link in the chat to that petition. Uh, it's just a super quick and easy way you can take action if you're left feeling helpless right now. We want to um, give you ways to be engaged. Um, so as many of you probably already know, uh, the Sierra Club is part of this coalition, Clean Up Midam, and 
We are a group of organizations that came together with this shared sense of urgency to pressure MidAmerican to retire their full fleet. Um, I think we have about 10 orgs in our coalition. They, MidAmerican is the single biggest carbon polluter in, in the state and have been polluting our air, water, personal health for decades, and they plan to continue to do so until 2050, um, unless we have something to do with it. So that's my quick pitch on that. Um, and if you're in the Sioux City area, we have an awesome new organizer on staff with us up there. Her name is Lexi. Um, I can drop her email in the chat for those of you that might want to get more engaged if you're up in Northwest Iowa. And we do have a couple questions. I don't know if you have more slides, yep. David, but um, I, I do. But I, I realize, of of course, the problem with me and the professor is I talk too much. So let's look at the questions. Um, I'm going to start with the second one, where um, Carrie has told us that the Renewable Energy Wildlife Institute uh, is hosting a series of free webinars, and she posted the link to that in the chat. So you guys might want to check that out um, so that you can um, see that. And she even just um, posted. <laughs> Uh, the recordings from the previous webinars from the Renewable Energy Wildlife Institute. And then we have a question. Are there partnerships with the Department of Transportation to add native plants? Um, because um, as farmers, uh, she and her husband are getting approached by power companies to add solar panels um, to his field. Would native plants surrounding these solar fields be a viable solution? I don't know what the partnerships might be with the Department of Transportation. So I'm not sure that I can answer that one um, directly. Um, Patrick raised his hand. Do, do you, Patrick, do you have something? Yeah. Let me see I can if I can bring you off mute, Patrick, if you want to answer this one verbally, if that's what you're going for. Hold on. Give me a second. While you're bringing them off mute, what I would say is that we have um, solar <laughs> panels where um, plants, so native prairie, but also uh, crops can grow underneath solar panels and around the solar panels, depending upon how the solar um, installation uh, has been designed. Patrick. You beat me to it, David. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've been, been, spending, <clears throat> been spending some time in that business for the last uh, four or five years. And uh, you can put perennial grasses and forbs underneath solar panels. As a matter of fact, wherever the soil fertility, you know, if you're putting panels on ground that would just grow vegetation otherwise, you can pick uh, a seed mix that's appropriate for the soil and the climate, that sort of thing, wherever you're putting up your array, and uh, you actually create habitat. This builds soil. Uh, you can, uh, there's ways, different ways to manage it. You can graze sheep underneath solar panels, which builds soil fertility more quickly. You can leave it alone and let pollinators inhabit it and harvest honey, uh, not to mention all the other insects that go for, you know, a plant mix like that. And um, you, it would take about one and a half percent of all the agricultural land in Minnesota to supply all of that state's electrical power needs with solar only. It's even less than that because they've already got a lot of wind. The numbers for Iowa will be quite similar. And uh, just, just wanna say, because we get pushback on this all the time, I don't wanna take fertile ground out of production. We'll put it in a different kind of production. And this is a particular kind of production that makes a great deal of sense. Also, I'll just give you a number. Typically, for a landowner that is offered uh, anything from a 20 to 30 acre community solar installation on up to many hundreds of acres in a utility scale installation, uh, you're going to typically those pay per acre two to three times as much as what they get from a corn and soy rotation, you know, net, acre by acre. Uh, and it's less variable, you know, as long as there's demand for electric power, it's gonna be steady income stream. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, this is an area where you could do a lot, particularly for insect and wildlife uh, by, uh, 
but particularly insects, pollinators, with uh, with prairie grasses and forms underneath solar panels at just about any scale. Thank you. Well, thank yeah, you, Patrick. Thanks. And and I really like the what what you said. You know, we don't want to take land out of production. You don't have to put it into a different type of That's production. Great. That is a it's a great great, great thing. Um. One question, can a copy of this presentation be shared on other sites? I would assume the answer is yes, but Emma, you'd probably know. Uh, as far as your slides, you, you're you welcome to do whatever you like with those, David. Uh, but uh, we have, a, we're recording this right now and we will put it on YouTube and the email it out along with our other webinars from uh, previous months. And then another question, how can we help to enhance corridor development? Are there forces doing this in Southeast Iowa? I first heard of corridors while studying NRCS information. Um, actually, I, I want to urge you to start with the NRCS because the NRCS um, has individuals who are there to work with landowners to um, put in native vegetation. Now, often that's up to the landowner. And so it can be wildly different, unfortunately, from acreage to acreage. Um, but that is an excellent place uh, to start in terms of who's helping to put in corridors. Um, otherwise, I'm not as aware of a lot of organizations that are working in Southeast Iowa, although I have no doubt someone is. Um, uh, my work is more up here in Northwest Iowa, so that's that's what I'm familiar with. Emma, do you know any more? I mean, if you're not already involved with the Southeast Iowa group with the Sierra Club, you should be because they're doing a lot of great work. Down yeah, there. they're one of the most active groups in Iowa. Yeah. 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 And and you can get something started through them too. Uh, that's I most of my work has been has been done through Northwest Iowa Sierra Club. Carrie's on online here. You can ask her. I've created a lot of extra work for her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. Did you have more slides to go through? I mean, I have a couple more, but it depends on, on how much time we have. Um, oh, yes. Love this. <laughs> I would uh, encourage people, you've all heard about the carbon dioxide pipelines, probably, that have been proposed. There are many problems with the carbon dioxide pipelines, but the one that I want to focus on here is that um, roughly 60% of the corn that is grown in Iowa, it now goes to ethanol production. And when it's converted to ethanol, the idea is that's gonna be mixed with gasoline to be put into our fuel tanks. So basically corn production now supports further burning of fossil fuels. And then the corn itself of course is grown largely with fossil fuels, either having produced some of the fertilizers and the herbicides and that sort of thing, or with large tractors, et cetera, et cetera. We know that's a fossil fuel based uh, system now. Um, so opposing the carbon dioxide pipelines has also been a way of fighting climate change. Uh, Sierra Club has called this greenwashing. This is um, sold as one of the solutions to climate change, but it's not a real solution to climate change because what it really does is it really supports the fossil fuel industry. In the top right is um, where the uh, carbon dioxide pipelines have been proposed, the routes in Iowa and Minnesota, and Nebraska and the Dakotas. And then at the bottom is a wonderful picture that was taken by Emma a couple of years ago um, uh, at Briarcliff University. It's actually the hill that's going up to the Sioux City Prairie right next to Briarcliff. Um, where we held an event called Prairies, Not Pipelines. <laughs> um, and then just lastly, I just wanted to, to look at the other big elephant in the room in Iowa, which is big ag. And what can we do to loosen the, the, the hold that big agriculture has on the politics of Iowa? I think Patrick really brought it up um, pretty well with the idea of, we don't, whoops, we don't want to take um, land, you know, productive land out of uh, production. But the problem is um, it doesn't have to be in the type of production that it's in currently. Um, if you planted carrots, it would still be in production. The difference would be that instead of supporting the production of ethanol, you'd actually be supporting the production of human food. 
Um, why not, you know, do that? Um, so the Iowa chapter has done a lot of work on sustainable agriculture. There's their um, agricultural site. Um, and of course, um, one of the things that they're really working on now is a moratorium on new CAFOs in Iowa. They are the com uh, confined animal feeding organizations um, where animals are, you know, it's basically the factory production of meat and milk and that sort of thing. Um, there are really good reasons to have a moratorium on CAFOs. Um, and uh, if you go to their site, you can see some of those reasons. And that's it. I'm finally done. I'm sorry that I took so long. Uh, that's always the danger. No, it's great. You are a wealth of knowledge on this. So very happy to have you and to dig in deep on this issue. Um, I guess I, let's see if I have any other links to share. Um, not really. I guess I just wanted to say, uh, you know, we wanted to do this webinar in particular to really move people to more action to protect the environment. Um, at Sierra Club, our motto is to explore, enjoy, and protect, and you can't do one of those things without the others. So I hope people think about this in ways that they can take action in their community, across the state, and that will have impacts across the world. Um, one thing that kept coming to mind for me as David was talking was there's kind of like the, the front end and the back end of this. Um, the back end being the pollution that we're causing with fossil fuels, burning coal at the coal plants, emitting carbon and then the back end or the front end, I don't know, it's like the uh, the corridors. It's kind of like the solutions that we're coming up with because these things are happening. We need to create corridors because of the problems that the uh, burning of fossil fuels has caused among other things. So um, you can fight it from either way or work towards just a more sustainable future because we are all a part of this ecosystem. It impacts all of us. Um, so yeah, really grateful to you, David, for presenting to us tonight. Really excited for the group, the Northwest, uh, for the work the Northwest group is doing and events you have coming up. I don't know if you have a link to share for that. Um, yeah, I, I do have, um, actually, do I have an email? I'll just um give you my home email instead of the work email but um i guess that's in the answered uh questions now um so hope hopefully you can you can see the email um if you have your questions about something specific since i've given this broad overview uh, i'm happy to provide resources for you or or other um, specifics that you might be interested in. But we have an event coming up June 15 um, up here in Sioux City. Um, what is wild in Northwest Iowa? Um, what we're trying to do is get a group of people who are interested in restoring corridors, in the concept of, of rewilding, in the concept of, of you know, being wild in Iowa, essentially, and, and having wildlife in Iowa uh, to actually come together. And um, we're going to meet at the Dorothy Pico Nature Center um, at, and I think, Emma? I just yes. dropped a link. Oh, your yep. screen share got a little wonky again. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stop, I'm stop okay. sharing because I realized when I click on something, that yes, the, <laughs> that that probably went weird. Um, but um, the link that Emma just uh, put up that's on Facebook is to our Northwest Iowa Facebook, and it shows the entire event. The event um, will last from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. There are presentations, but the whole idea of the entire afternoon is devoted to what are your ideas? What can we do? Something simple, something complex, whatever you're interested in. That's the whole idea. Um, the group will generate their own ideas. I'm not going to dictate to the group. <laughs> Other members of Northwest Iowa are not going to dictate to the group. We'll give you some examples of things that could be done. Um, but the whole idea is how do we stimulate 
rewilding here in uh, Northwest Iowa. That's what we want to do. Um, uh, so 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, drinks and snacks are provided throughout the day, plus lunch will be catered. So you don't have to worry. Even if you didn't have uh, breakfast, there will be food for you. Um, lunch is provided. There will be snacks in the afternoon. Um, so come one, come all on June 15, which is a Saturday, um, to the Dorothy Pico Nature Center. That's awesome. I'm hoping I can make it up there for that. So uh, we have somebody wondering if it's going to be, if that's going to be on Zoom. I don't think that this event is going to be on Zoom uh -uh, okay. because it's it's a large gathering. We're, we're hoping to get, you know, maybe 80 people together or so um, at the Dorothy Pico Nature Center and really have a, a good discussion and, you know, a large groundswell of how do we foster rewilding uh, in the Northwest Iowa and, you know, the tri-state area, since we're right next to southeastern South Dakota and northeastern Nebraska. Yeah, 